All right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar conversation about Camus, The Plague. We've been really looking forward to this for a while now and it's finally here. And so we're so happy that you're all uh, joining us. There's more people on the way, um, 31 people so far uh, in, the, in the discussion. And I'm just really excited to, um, to be able to, to share this with you. So thanks so much for the enthusiasm. There's been a lot of interest in this and i um, really looking forward to, uh, to diving into this topic with you all. Um, we've given about an hour for this conversation. Um, it may be that we need a little more time than that. And if, if you wanna stay around and we're motoring along, feel free. Um, I'll have to probably take off after about one hour, not too much longer. Um, but happy to have uh, happy to have you all here. So a uh, little bit about how we're going to do this. I have everyone on mute for now, uh, besides our hosts, and um, we'll have opportunity for you to ask questions and interact with all of us. Uh, there's a chat um, bar on the bottom. You can click chat, and there's a chat window that will open up on the right. I'll keep an eye on that. If you are on Facebook. Welcome, if you're watching us on Facebook, uh, we're excited that uh, we're live streaming there as well. And I have a colleague who's gonna be checking the comments there, so feel free to engage in the conversation on Facebook Live. Um, I am going to introduce our guests and just say a little bit about how we uh, got this started, uh, how, how we came to, uh, to have this event. So. I was, this is Iran, by the way, um, Algeria behind me. I tried to find the most unromantic view that I could find. There were some with overlooking the ocean cliff over on, on a cliff. And I thought, no, that's far too idyllic for the subject matter. So I tried to find a, a street that looked kind of uh, about like what Camus complained about or Ryu. Um, so Anyway, I, I was uh, browsing Twitter, as I want to do, and, and Greg Epstein, uh, the humanist chaplain at MIT and Harvard, had tweeted something about the plague, and I, I was immediately interested because I decided to read this again um, during this COVID-19 outbreak, and my girlfriend said to me, isn't that a little morbid or a little on the nose? And I said, no, I think this is perfect because I had read it before, and I just wanted to see how it sounded uh, during this time. And so... Greg and I started hatching this idea and realized we needed someone to help us. And the Twitterverse um, led us to, to Jamie. Um, so I want to ask them to introduce themselves, uh, say a little bit about um, uh, what they do, and then we're going to get into this conversation. You want to start, Greg? Oops, you're muted. Let me unmute you if I can find you. Uh, there you go. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks, Ryan. It's great to see you and Jamie and um, everybody on the call. I see some friends. Um, so glad you're hanging out with us tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, Ryan, I, I think it was you actually that, that tweeted something about how you were rereading it. And, uh, you know, that's my memory anyway. And I, I went over to your Twitter and I said, hey, we should do a webinar because I just I was – in my way, kind of flailing around for, for things to do that felt meaningful um, at that time. And, you know, still am. I mean, who the hell knows what is a meaningful thing to do in this, uh, in this situation, but we're all, we're all trying our best in, you know, one way or another. And so I, you know, I said, like, let's, let's do something together because I've been wanting to work with you for a while. Um, and I figured, it, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't going to fly to just, just be you and me. Um, so uh, I was right because we, we, we found um, an amazing person in Jamie. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about it later, but, um, but I, I wrote a book uh, that some people might know called Good Without God and, and uh, the plague uh, Camus novel features prominently in it. So I've been thinking about it for, you know, over like a dozen years, really. This, this book has been central to my thinking about humanism. And uh, it just got even more relevant, didn't it? So <laughs> for now. Tragically so. Jamie, introduce yourself, please. So I am Jamie Lombardi. I teach philosophy at Bergen Community College in New Jersey, um, and I tweet way too much about Albert Camus. Um, and we, like right before the plague had, had broken out, I had been asked if I would be interested in, in writing a book on Camus, which I am 
currently mulling over. Uh, but if anybody is, is interested in Camus, um, you can find me tweeting about him on Twitter. Um, every Saturday, I tweet out um, a passage from one of his works with the hashtag Saturday with Camus. Um, so I'm very excited to be here to, to actually talk about Camus to people who want to hear about Camus um, instead of driving everybody I know absolutely crazy um, with my nonstop commentary about other Camus, who is my absolute favorite. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I want to uh, ask Jamie to get us started. Um, there's so much background and context and uh, to know about about the story. I mean, you can appreciate it simply as it is. Uh, it's, it's really accessible, um, like so much, uh, maybe all of Camus' work. Uh, I, I find it incredibly easy to read and dive into. It doesn't, you don't have to be a literary critic to understand it, but some background certainly helps. And so, Jamie, help us out by um, giving us a little bit of that background sense of what we're dealing with and the context, what Camus was up to here. So Camus wrote the plague during World War II, um, which currently I kind of hate him for because I'm personally finding it difficult to write so much as an email um, as we just sort of shelter in place and deal with this. But during World War II, Camus, while he was writing this, was also a member of the French Resistance um, in occupied Paris during World War II. He was the editor of the Resistance underground newspaper, Combat. And then for a period of time, Camus spent some time in what was called the Free Zone in, the, in southern France, in a little town called Les Chambon, which I've probably mispronounced, where it was a poor rural farming village. And under the leadership of Andre Trocme, they had saved somewhere between three to 5,000 Jews from the Gestapo. And this was informative for him because what they had reported about their desire to do this was basically that it was just doing the right thing. And it was just a matter of helping who was there to be helped. And so he was around this environment recovering from a bout of tuberculosis. And I think it's impossible to really understand the plague and his emphasis on healing and just digging your heels in and doing what can be done without an understanding of that. Great, thank you. Um, so we, we talked for a little while here uh, a few days ago, the three of us and getting ready for this, a little bit about um, some of the main themes and what we appreciated most about this, uh, this novel uh, this is my second time reading it, but I'm certainly not an expert. But it was it was interesting um, saying saying to to Greg earlier that for me, having been trained as a theologian and reading theological texts, the Bible, um, I, I noticed a lot of themes that one would find in um, the Hebrew Bible. For example, the the theme of exile is uh, a huge, probably the central theme of of the uh, the Hebrew Bible, and um, and so let's talk a little bit about what these, I guess, the key themes are. And Greg, you said you wrote, um, and I, I remember when I first did my Year Without God, I, I read your book, and, um, and it was actually during the Year Without God, my, in 2014, when I had first stepped away from religion and stepped away from my faith, that I entered into some reading that I had been pretty much forbidden to do as a Christian. Um, I was not, um, you know, I, I was strongly discouraged, even forbidden from reading authors like Camus. So I, I started with the plague, um, knowing that there were some religious themes there. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you see this novel fitting into a post-theist or a humanist kind of worldview and what the major kind of themes are that you were interested in exploring. Sure. But we, I just want to understand that right. So you, you you started with the plague at what point though? Like when you were first exploring what it would look like to live a life without without belief in a god? Yeah, yeah. Like I, I read um, Candide uh, because Voltaire is like you know the Seventh Day Adventist Church is like explicitly forbids by name uh, Candide. Mm -hmm. I mean Voltaire, Voltaire, and also um, uh, like Thomas Paine. Uh, these infidel authors, they were called. I, and by the way, Ryan, I just want to say, I just want to introduce you for a second to, you know, there are some followers of mine that might not be that familiar with you and your work. 
and I, I really enjoy you and your work. And, and so, I, you know, I want people to know this is Ryan Bell. He happens to work uh, for the Secular Student Alliance. Um, he happens to also work as a humanist chaplain at, at USC. Is that right? Yeah. And, um, and you know, succeeding a, a good friend of mine who was the former humanist chaplain at USC, Bart Campolo, and I actually recommended you both, I think, for that position. Um, and, uh, and you, you know, you had this great project where you were a theologian, you were a pastor um, in a pretty strongly Christian community. Um, and then you, you first did your year without God. And I thought, oh, that's a creative project. And, and now here you are, you're one of the um, most prominent and um, most uh, eloquent and thoughtful humanist leaders in, in the United States. Um, so anyway, um, I... <laughs> Um, for reasons that I think we'll get into later today, actually, uh, later tonight. But, um, but anyway, so, so for me, um, I read the, the, the novel, uh, The Plague, first in, uh, in an existentialism seminar at Harvard Divinity School with a visiting professor who was um, at Harvard Divinity School from Stanford, uh, Lanier Anderson, for the, I think it was the first semester that I got to Harvard Divinity School when I was a very young chaplain. Uh, exploring what it was going to mean for me to be a humanist chaplain. Um, brand new to the idea. I was serving for that year, um, 2004 to 2005, as the assistant humanist chaplain at Harvard um, to Tom Farrick, the, the founder of my position and the first humanist chaplain in North America. Um, and, uh, you know, he'd been a sort of longtime hero of mine, and, and here I was. Um, not really sure what this was all going to mean after three, four years of sort of following him around uh, from a distance and, and hoping that I could work for him one day. And, um, and I took this existentialism class and uh, in it discovered um, some thinkers that I really uh, were real revelations to me, others that I'd already read a lot, some that I didn't love that much. I mean, I'm kind of one of these people that, you know, could tell Kierkegaard, like, just go take your leap of faith and just, just take it into the lake and, you know, you swim away, swim away. Um, but, but this novel was um, incredibly meaningful to me. Um, and uh, at the end, we got to pick seminar papers, you know, topics for seminar paper. And I always tell, like, anybody aspiring to any kind of public role or role as a writer or whatever if they go to grad school especially if they go to divinity school like just pick your seminar papers with you know anything that you think you might want to write a chapter about or a book about you know later in in life um so i picked this this book and i what i ended up writing about was um the the way in which uh the novel essentially compels us to ask the question what is the meaning of my life Hmm. What is the meaning of a human life? And we'll get into this more later, so I'll, I'll wrap it up for now and sort of return to it. But I just want to say the idea is, um, especially for those that aren't for that familiar with the plot, um, this is a novel where, uh, and, and Jamie and even Ryan will state this more completely and more eloquently than I will, but um, this is a novel in which people are trapped in a situation um, in a city uh, called Oran, uh, French Algeria, where um, the, the plague, the, a viral plague, a mysterious viral plague, has arisen or returned or mutated or whatever. And they're stuck and it's deadly and it's fearsome and there's no cure and there's no real treatment. And nobody can get out of the city because the city has been completely walled off and there's just no way out. And everybody is forced to deal with the fact that, that everybody's life is in danger. And the point that I want us to get into during this seminar, or this webinar, whatever, is that that's all of us. Not just now because of, uh, because of the coronavirus, COVID-19, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's all of us at all times. We are all trapped in a walled city in which none of us is going to get out alive. Mm. And so we're all confronted with the situation constantly uh, where we have to figure out what do I do with myself? What do I do with my life? How do I make myself useful? How do I have relationships when I'm trapped in that kind of desperate, mortal, 
uh, existential, literally, situation. So that's, that's me in the book. Yeah, that's fascinating. I'm obsessed yeah. with that question because I, you know, my whole life, and I think until I die, I will be obsessed with that question for various reasons we don't have time for right now. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting to observe throughout the the novel that, you know, the the main character, Doctor Rio, has this um, really honest and and sort of um, stark, unembellished view of life. But he's not without pleasure and joy and love, and but he he's not he doesn't entertain illusions about um, you know hope and um, one of the things that I've uh, I've often thought well, I'll save this uh, that that thought for another maybe a little bit later. Um, so you know as we think about meaning and I know a lot of people that start off religious in life and sort of become humanist and secular um, are challenged by their co former co religionists about meaning and how you can have meaning in life. And this question comes up for the doctor as well. How can you, you know, do the things you do and care the way you do without God? Or do you believe in God? And if not, like, how do you manage that? Um, and, you know, uh, Jamie, I wanted to get your take on this because I know one of the things you've shared with me is um, another key theme in Camus in, in light of sort of what Greg said, like none of us are getting out of this alive, right? We're all sort of trapped in this walled city where life is both beautiful and tragic. And, um, and, and so what, what's, you talked to me a little bit about rebellion. Can you go into a little bit of that? Like what's, um, how does he approach that? Sure. So most people who are familiar with Camus are familiar with his work of the myth of Sisyphus and the stranger. And this is where Camus introduces his notion of the absurd. And that's our confrontation with a world that is devoid of meaning, that is unreasonable, and our desire for that meaning. But for Camus, the absurd is just a, a starting point. It's what he calls a, a point of departure. And he says that ultimately the, the absurd has three consequences. And for him, that's defiance or revolt, um, his freedom and passion. And so I think what he's starting to, to flesh out here in, in the plague is how we respond to the absurd, how we deal with the metaphysical conditions of our reality and move forward from that. And I think for Camus, the answer for that is this sort of defiance or, you know, where I've described it in other places as sort of like a rebellious joy where we sort of dig in our heels and, and we fight for whatever happiness is available to us while we can. And I think you see elements of this play, of this in the plague as well, where there's, there's a scene where Rambo, Rambert is talking to Dr. Ryu about leaving. And he's finally managed to, to bribe enough of the guards at the gate and he's able to get out. And ultimately he decides against it and he decides to stay and, and do the work. But he's having this conversation with Dr. Ryu, where he's ostensibly supposed to be leaving, and he asks Dr. Ryu, you know, do you, are you not judging me for my desire to be happy? Mm. And Ryu says to him, you know, far be it for me to, to come down against the side of happiness. And there's this element here that the little bit of happiness and joy that we're able to eke out um, in, in the world amidst so much horror can sometimes supply us the courage that we need to keep fighting. And I think that's one of the central scenes of, of this novel here is, is how we find a meaning, how we get back up and face the day when the reality is we've got nothing to look forward to except being ground into dust. I love that scene towards the end where um, Taru and, and Rio go swimming uh, in the ocean sort of against the rules, but it's late at night and they have security passes. And uh, it's this really beautiful scene. In fact, maybe my favorite uh, part of the book is Taru's long monologue there about suffering and about committing himself to doing no harm, essentially, to not um, being on the side of the, of the pestilence. Um, and that seemed like an act of rebellion, you know, to like eke a little joy out of the misery. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Dr. Ryu gets a lot of the focus when people talk about the plague as the hero of the novel, and that's certainly true. Camus ends talking about, you know, how the best that we can do in many of these circumstances is just to be healers. But I think Teru also gets to the heart of the philosophy that Camus was trying to stretch out. 
In fact, in one of his, his notebooks that Camus edited for publication, he says that Tiru is the man who can understand everything um, and who suffers because he thereby cannot judge anything. Mm. And so Tiru sort of has this sympathy um, with the plight of man and the difficulty of their circumstances. And I think this is revealed as well when, you know, through the narrator or Dr. Ryu, where he's talking about Teru trying to make sense of, of Cotard, who is, you know, at least on the face of it, like the least sympathetic character in this whole novel. You know, we don't know exactly what the crime he's committed is, um, but he's certainly thrilled that the plague has, you know, closed the gates down of the city and he's temporarily saved from the long arms of justice and absolutely loses his mind at the end of the novel because plague is over and he's going to have to, you know, face judgment. And yet Camus takes great pains to emphasize that Tyru's understanding, Tyru's refusal to condemn anyone else as guilty um, is central to our understanding of this notion of rebellion that he's trying to flesh out. And as it relates to what Greg is talking about, what this means for how we can come up with a meaning for our lives. Ryan, I had this image of uh, maybe Anthony Fauci and uh, doctor, uh, one, one doctor that came to my mind was um, Dr. Uh, Kismakaya um, uh, Corbett, who's a, a, a virologist who's really working hard on a vaccine right now. And, you know, just, just picturing them, um, you know, going for a swim and like trying to figure this all out together. Um, but, um, but I, I actually, I, I wanted to ask uh, Jamie maybe a, a question about, um, about Ryu, the, the doctor, the sort of central character of this novel, um, because maybe there are some people on the, the call, the webinar that, um, you know, not as familiar with the book or like me, you know, you've read it a long time ago, mostly, and, and um, you know, you, you don't remember every detail. And, you know, we won't have time to get into all these different characters, of course, but I thought, you know, you as somebody that's a, you know, you're a historian of this material, or at least an expert on this material, and um, you just talk a little bit about the central character, Ryu, who is, um, he's essentially the, the stand-in for Camus himself, is that right? And, would you say that? Uh, you know, I'm not sure which of the characters I would point to as the stand-in for Camus. I don't know that Camus can conceived of himself as a hero, and there's certainly elements of all of the different characters that seem sort of autobiographical. Camus worked for a period as a journalist, so there's elements of that um, mm. in Rio uh, or in Rambert. He um, was a member of the French Resistance, so you can see elements of that in, in Teru. Um, he was certainly separated from his wife during periods of World War II. So I think that ties into, you know, Dr. Ryu's sense of, of being exiled from his wife and sending her away for care. Um, mm -hmm. And I think Camus particularly dealt with a lot of guilt and his sense of personal responsibility for the people that he um, was associated with. And I think elements of that come out through all of the characters. I don't know that I would say that Ryu is the autobiographical character for Camus, but certainly there are, there are still, But still the protagonist, right? I mean, the, 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 the number one, I mean, you know, he's the, the sort of central character where Camus chose to create this novel, this metaphor for our, our predicament of mortality, um, because, you know, a lot of the other writing that, that Camus did where um, where he was really getting to his philosophy, um, his mature philosophy after the stranger, um, it was nonfiction. And so this is the, this is, you know, really the, the number one, I think, character that, that he wrote, fictional character that he wrote that represents sort of, if, if anybody does, his worldview. And he chose to make it a doctor treating the sick in a plague. And so can you just talk a little bit more about the, the, the nature of the character and what you think that character has to say for, you know, for even our moment now? Sure. So in the beginning of the plague, Dr. Ryu's wife is sick, which is certainly autobiographical in the sense that Camus' wife also suffered tremendously from mental health issues that were in no small way exacerbated by Camus' proclivity for philandering. Um, but he sends her away to get the care that she needs and he sets about caring for the townsfolk as they come down with 
the plague. And he becomes this central character that relates to the other characters in the novel as they form sanitation squads and set about the task of, of doing what needs to be done in order to, to sort of defeat um, this virus. Mm -hmm. um, the, what was this? Remind me again what the second part of your question was. Well, I mean, I, I guess, you know, just the idea of, of, of what do you take? Um, and we were going to get, uh, Brian, we, I don't want to step on the toes of, of what we're going to get into towards, towards the second half, although we're getting towards the second half now. But I just wanted to, to know, like, what your take on, you know, wh what, what it means to you to read this doctor character at a time when doctors dealing with something so similar seeming uh, have become really the sort of central figures in all of our lives once again. So I think one of the things that Camus is trying to get at here is, is I think he's trying to tackle the sort of traditional notion of success that we have, where in order to, to be successful or in order to, to live a life with meaning, um, we need to be victorious, right? We need to win for ourselves. And I think he's really challenging that here because when you're a doctor and you're going into hospital wings and you're up against a plague, you know that there's a real chance that you're going to succumb to this as well and that you're, you're confronting your own mortality. And I think what Camus is, is getting at here is this idea that we have to sort of reconceptualize our notion of what success means, that we're not actually going to be able to save ourselves. There's no possibility of not dying, as horrifying as that is. But that doesn't mean that we can't make the world better for those who will come after us. Mm. And one thing that I think about a lot, there are, um, there's a book that Camus had translated into the French that was originally written in English. And it's a very short picture book of all things. And it's written by James Thurber and the title of it is The Last Flower. Mm. And it's this really beautiful story about the cyclical nature of, of human lives and human society reaches a crisis point and it destroys itself through weapons of mass destruction and everything is is bleak and destroyed and after a period of time a woman is is walking along and she comes across a flower and she's sort of stunned by the natural beauty of this flower that had managed to eke an existence out amongst the wasteland and while she's there enjoying the flower a boy comes along and he sees her admiring this flower and he falls in love with her and they begin to repopulate humanity again. Um, and over time, you know, society builds back up and war starts again and everything is destroyed again and everybody dies. And the story ends with the emergence of another flower. And it's sort of an allusion to the idea that a lot of this is cyclical. We're never going to get to a sort of final victory but it doesn't mean that those moments of beauty in between, those moments of connectedness, the value of friendship and love, aren't themselves valuable while we have them. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, it's interesting, as I was reading this, and even just now thinking about my own experience listening to you guys talk, um, there's a story about part of my coming to terms with my faith and my loss of faith that I haven't really told much is um, right before I was let go from my, my church denomination, um, I had gone to the Mexican, U.S. Mexican border with a group of journalists and clergy and uh, human rights activists uh, to see it at Juarez. And we were spending a few days in, um, in Juarez and a few days in El Paso looking at um, the problem of, of um, gun violence and violence in general, violence against women. Um, in the years right before I went there, Ciudad Juarez was uh, the most violent and deadly place in the plant on the planet, um, including all the war zones at that time. And I was really struggling with my faith at that time. And our host and the person that was sort of guiding the trip, um, I was sort of bunked right next to him in this um, boarding house where undocumented women and children were living uh, in, on the El Paso side. And we had just come back from um, Ciudad Juarez and we had just heard some just gut-wrenching stories of people losing their families and their loved ones to the cartel and just random acts of violence that were just terrifying and terrorizing the community. And I was, you know, on the brink of losing my faith and faced with, I guess, the problem of evil writ large for me, like the biggest and most bold, the boldest sort of confrontation I'd ever had with that. And as we're sort of laying down in our beds, the lights are out, I said to, to this guy um, who's remained a friend, 
I said, you know, how, are you a person of faith? And he said, no, not really. You know, I've never really been a person of faith. And I said, so how do you maintain hope in the mid, like when you're confronted with this kind of scene um, and these stories? And he said, you know, I've really never put a lot of stock in hope. Um, he said, the thing for me is love. And, um, you know, we can, we can demonstrate love without hope. And I was so blown away by that. And my theological mind went to faith, hope, and love. And, um, and my final sermon that I gave in my church before I hung it up was about how, you know, Paul's sort of formula that when faith fails and when hope fails, there's, there's love. And I, I really detect a lot of that in this story, that there's really no hope at some point. And Ryu and others are not people of faith, and they have this confrontation with the priest who's essentially asking them the same kind of question. And, and it's, it's love that keeps them moving forward, and it's the pursuit of moments of love and that, that I think drives the, and is the sort of secret motivation. It seems secret to a lot of people, like they can't understand why people would do something good in the face of so much horror, why not be selfish? And it comes down to, for them to love. Hmm. I have to reboot this thing real quick, this uh, slideshow. But yeah, someone, someone. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the, the thought that brought up for me is, you know, having written a lot about this pithy word formula, good without God, um, love without hope it could potentially be another way of stating it, um, particularly, particularly when I'm um, thinking in terms of the, the why question, you know, why live the way we live or, or you know, what kind of life should we choose? Um, this, you know, the idea of um, living a life of love without, without a certain kind of hope. Um, and I think this moment that we're all living right now um, is a particularly good illustration or, or it really is, um, is a powerful way to bring out um, what I feel like I'm, I, I find myself thinking about even in sort of more quote unquote normal moments, um, which is, um, you know, this, this feeling that we have right now, um, you know, I, and again, I, I hesitate to use the we because I, I, you know, I don't know who identifies with, with what I'm thinking, who doesn't, but um, but this feeling that I get anyway right now where, you know, we're all like, I, 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 I listen to people just sort of lashing out at one another online or, or, you know, picking each other apart. Um, you know, I, I, I sort of have this feed that, that scrolls past me every day where, you know, one person will be screaming out in grief and pain and anger and another person will be cracking a joke. Um, you know, and another person will be, you know, making a political point. And um, at times, I'm all three of those people, um, often at the wrong time, eat for each. And um, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's this, um, there's this feeling um, of, is it possible for us to have this conversation right now where we're all so justifiably so frustrated um, with more love and sort of less hope, like less hope that it's just going to get better and then we'll have love and more love now in the middle of this shit. Mm. Um, and I, I could say more about it, but I'll leave it there and see what that prompts in others. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, I want to be aware, I want to open the, the floor up to you for our, our guests to also ask questions, and I, but I wanted to, I guess, um, I want to come to this point that you and I were talking about yesterday, if that's okay. Is that, is that a good time? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah oh, you want me to set it up? Yeah, let me set it up for a second. If you want to, sure. Um, Jamie, unless, Jamie, unless you want to interject with anything. Uh, no, go ahead. Um, so, uh, just this idea, um, Ryan, that, um, I was writing 
um, about the plague uh, and, and the sense of um, uh, what is the meaning of life. Um, and wrote a chapter about that. And, uh, and for people who are listening, you know, what I'd love to sort of get your reactions to, your responses to, maybe a chat or whatever, is, um, is this idea of, you know, so which are the things that we point to? Like, like is, it, is it be all you can be, that that's the meaning of life? You know, is it, um, you know, is it, is it make the most of oneself? Is, is, it, is it strive for something in particular? Is it love? Uh, is it, you know, and, and sort of, I, I went through this whole long chapter, like, you know, rehearsing this question with myself, like, is that the meaning of, is this the meaning? And it, it was a very, very personal search for me. Um, and I, you know, I invite people to, to sort of check out what, what my answers were at, at age 30 or so. Um, I think they're a little different now. And that's part of the point um, is that um, I realized several years later um, when I was uh, at the Humanist Hub, uh, which there are some people on the call who know exactly what I'm talking about there. Um, and working at the Humanist Hub for a few years, I realized really profoundly for myself that um, in all of that thinking about, you know, what is the meaning of my life? What is the meaning of our life? Um, I really hadn't stopped to fully contemplate when I was writing it um, how political the answer is for myself and, and in my judgment for all of us, that, that our answer to the meaning of life is inherently political, mm -hmm. um, no matter what we choose. Because if we choose, in my judgment now, uh, at this version of myself, if we choose a, a quote-unquote meaning of life that we say to ourselves and to others, oh, this is not a political meaning of life, um, which is something that I was a little bit inclined to choose back then. Um, then we're really making a political statement. We're saying my politics are that, you know, whatever I'm sort of endorsing, whatever is so present in my life that I can pretend that it isn't even political. Mm. Um, and, and for many people like myself, you know, relatively privileged, and I could qualify that statement, but pretty privileged person. I mean, you know, the status quo favored me as a young man. And so there I was endorsing it without even realizing it. Mm. Um, and what I wanted you to, to talk about, um, because I've really come to admire your political version of humanism um, and the way you blend um, politics with humanism and secularism. And, and Jamie, you had great things to say about this yesterday as well. So, I mean, I'd, I'd love it if you could both respond to that and then maybe we can take questions. Sure, yeah. Um, so I actually threw up a couple of quotes here I uh, want to put on the screen. Um, so I think, you know, I was, I was very much a, um, a person who, as my faith began to fade in my religious days and in my leadership of the congregation, I basically politicized my theology. I, I kind of really leaned heavily into liberation theology and a political theology. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, what motivated me then and now and how things have changed or more importantly, how they haven't changed. Um, and in this sort of somewhat bleak, I mean, I, I often define humanism as um, learning to live without promises, you know, so like Judaism and Christianity are full of promises. I mean, the whole thing is based on a promise, a promise given to Abraham, and then if you have the Christian version, that promise is expanded outwards to include Gentiles. And, and this promise is a promise of, of many things, that you'll live forever, but also that uh, you'll be you know, welcomed into this community that gives your life meaning. But beyond that, that there's, there is a meaning to be found. Like there is a, like a, a core of that to find and that it's in, within God and on all of that. Um, and when you step outside of that, um, there's, there's not that sort of same sort of central focus. And so learning to live without promises for me was really disorienting and I had to find a new way to orient myself. And I found so much resonance in this passage, um, uh, towards the end of the book. And this is again, in the words of Teru in that sort of fabulous sort of uh, dialogue conversation, largely monologue, uh, towards the end. And he says, 
All I maintain is that on this earth there are pestilences and there are victims, and it is up to us, as far as possible, not to join forces with the pestilences. In other words, let's not make anything, let's not make things worse, you know, by joining the bad side, even if there's not an explicitly good side. Um, I grant that we should add a third category, he finally says, that of the true healers. That's why I decided to take in every predicament the victim's side, so as to reduce the damage done. You know, it reminds me of the, the famous statement that silence, you know, in the face of, of uh, injustice is taking the side of the oppressor. And, and he says, you know, like, let's not take the side of the pestilence. Um, he goes on uh, a few, um, let me see. Oh man, this is tricky. I wanted to advance the slide. How do I do that? Sorry, folks. Um, wow. I mean, maybe we can have Jamie make some of the comments that she made. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just jump in while you figure that out. Camus yeah. writes elsewhere um, in Reflections on the Guillotine that is, it is the job of thinking people not to be on the side of the executioners. And this is That's very it. much a theme of his work. And um, in a biography of him, Jermaine Brie writes that it's, it's impossible to really separate the ethical from the political for Camus. And had he not died tragically in a car accident in 1960, I think he would have done a lot more work on the political development of his philosophy. And this was really what I think was his unfinished work, fleshing out this notion of rebellion, how this was supposed yeah. to work and practice. Um, and this, how that was to function ultimately came to be what resulted in the confrontation between him and John Paul Sartre, how to understand what that political response to our world was supposed to be. And yeah. so I think that's absolutely right for Camus, that these, these questions about meaning, these questions about ethics were inseparable from our political organization and the way that that leveraged power and how that differentially impacted different communities. Mm. And I think it's impossible to really get the, the most out of Camus without understanding where he was situated in the world and, and how he carried with him his own feeling of exile. Mm. He had grown up a French colonist, a, a Piet Noir, and I apologize for mispronouncing that, um, in the French colony in Algeria. He never quite felt like he belonged in the intellectual elite circles of, of Paris. He always had this sort of feeling of being an exile himself. But I think he was very much aware of how the, the reality of the world imposed on people this feeling of exile from their own lives. He writes frequently in many of his literary essays or his political essays, about how the poor are sort of dispossessed of their own lives and they're forced to sort of grind out their own existences just for substance, right, or subsistence. And they're not actually able to enjoy them, to make use of them, and that their youth is taken for them and they've lived their whole lives by the time they're 20 or 30 and the rest is just misery and keeping food on the table. So he was very much concerned with these questions. I, I don't think you can really get Camus without understanding how central a political project was to his ambition. I mean, and we're facing so many complicated problems, you know, in our society today. Um, we don't need to look far for, for that, evidence of that now, and never have, but especially now. And I think, you know, sometimes I'm a little paralyzed by not always knowing what the answers are, you know, what the solutions to the problems are. And I just find so much comfort in this idea that so I'm like a guiding star is to take the side of the victims. And so in, in, in whatever political debate, like whoever's being ground under the heel, that's the people that you want to stand with, not the people who, are, who have the heel on their back. And, and that just, to me, that's just an orienting principle. And so like so I do, and I, one of my comrades here from Pasadena, the Tenants Union is on the call as well. And, um, you know, we, we are struggling for low-income people here to have dignity and a safe place to live and have control over their housing. And we fight for that basically every day. And right now, especially as people have lost their jobs, millions and millions of people, tomorrow is rent payment day and mortgage payment day. Uh, a lot of people, even more than a month ago, aren't gonna be able to pay their rent. So a lot of times we'll get this question, like, well, what about landlords? You know, they have bill bills too. And I don't always say it this boldly, but I feel like I want to say 
I, I guess that's somebody else's problem. Like I, I, you know, I guess landlords should get together and figure out like what to do because all I know is that the victims are the people here that are being removed from their housing and whatever other solutions there are that I know for sure is wrong. And we need to fight for that um, inclusivity for where people can be a part of a community in which their housing needs and other human rights are taken seriously. So I just, I think, um, you know, I wanted to share this one last quote um, that um, he says, you know, a few, uh, just a few sentences later, uh, again, Taru said, I feel more fellowship with the defeated than with the saints. Maybe this is actually real. I feel more fellowship with the defeated than with the saints. Heroism and sanctity don't really appeal to me, I imagine, what interests me is being a man. And I think, you know, being a human, you know, in 1947, you know, he articulated it in that gendered way. But I think, you know, being a person, not, not to be a saint, not to be a hero, um, and, to, and to find his fellowship with the defeated. And, and yesterday I tweeted that this reminds me of the, the great German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer as he's in prison only maybe days away from his execution, writing to his best friend and saying, you know, it's just puzzling to me. He said, my, the Christian impulse in me makes me more interested in fellowship with the, the, the non-religious than with, you know, the pious that, that I know. Um, he just felt that that's where, like, the energy was, where the passion was, where the, the locus of his concern was at. And he, he actually specifies, not in an evangelistic way uh, at all. He even makes that clarification. Uh, uh, yeah, Ryan... Can I, can I mini interview you about one small aspect of this? Uh, sure. <laughs> we didn't plan this, but, uh, and, and Jamie, I, I'm not sure if you know this about Ryan, but, but I, you know, once, once I do, I'd like to get your thoughts on it as well. So, um, Ryan, you're, Ryan, you're currently running for political office. Is, is that right? Uh, no, it's actually over. I lost the election about a week before the California went into uh, stay at home orders. Aha. Oh, okay. So yeah. that's, that's why I haven't heard you mention it recently. Okay, sorry, sorry to dig up a, a painful oh. story there. No, you have I, to, I wanna... this is the other principle. You have to lose repeatedly in order to win something. Like you can't, you have to be willing to lose over and over and over and maybe never win. So anyway, keep going. No, no, the, the, okay, this is great. So I want to ask you about this. It might, you know, by the way, so my, my mom is on the call um, with us right now. Awesome. Her name is Judy. Um, and it's her birthday mom. tomorrow, so I mean, I have, to, I have to say that, you know, I mean, I, she, she, she gets at least that much, right? Um, and um, so she, she thinks I should run for office. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it, and I have this, like, text chain with her back and forth where, like, me sending her all the reasons why I'm not going to run for office. Um, even though, like, back a long time ago, like, when I had flowing blonde hair, um, like I really thought I was going to be president one day, but no, I'm like, <laughs> you know, but, um, but anyway, um, I, um, I wanted to ask you, so, okay, so you, you, you chose to run for, what was the office that you ran for? City Council of Pasadena. City Council of the City of Pasadena. Yeah. And you ran on a democratic socialist platform, is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's a nonpartisan election. A lot of city, uh, local city elections are nonpartisan by definition, but yes, essentially. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so, all right. But you, so the idea was, you know, you're somebody that believes as, as Jamie articulated, right, that, that we should, that, that, that we need to rebel against the world as we find it, right? Yeah. That, that we, you know, that we, we need to make our lives an act of rebellion against the, the imperfection, the, the ugliness, mm -hmm. the injustice that we find in, in this world that, that evolved by happenstance. Um, and you know, we, we are Sisyphus for those of you who, who've heard me ramble on about that, um, many times. And, um, and so you, you chose at least in this one stage of your life, you know, in addition to working as a humanist chaplain and, and, um, secular professional and writer and speaker and whatever, that you were going to, you were going to represent your local, um, you know, your city, your, your, your small part of the world, if they would have you in this office. And could you just say something about that, that choice? Because I, I, I find it sort of difficult to wrap my mind around. Like I, sometimes I see myself as like, I'm very interested in big picture, but like the, I, I'm very afraid of the idea of like, what, I would have to represent Somerville, you know, like yeah. this little city that I live in. Like, I don't know, Somerville problems, you know, like, 
what was it about that potential pursuit of, of you know, the thinking that you were going to represent your own city, mm. in, given your very well thought out worldview that was meaningful to you? Yeah. And Jamie, like, what, what are your thoughts on politicians? You, you know, like, like, can, can politicians be, be, you know, do their work in the spirit of Camus? Yeah. Like almost a hopeless pursuit and hopeless. You see well, I mean, Greg, there? if you Anyways. run for office, I'll come out and run your campaign. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't know. I'm so full disclosure. I'm a Bernie bro. I am, you know, terribly jaded um, by what's happened in politics, particularly in the Democratic primary in 2020. I'm, I'm thoroughly disgusted by all of it. I want to hold out hope that it's possible politicians can, can do the right thing and run for the right reasons. Um, I'm currently very discouraged that many of them are interested in doing that if it means it's going to come at the expense of their proximity to power and the lifestyle that they've gotten accustomed to. I do think, um, though, that Camus would have urged politicians to be sort of rebellious and to fight for the common man, although Camus notoriously um, was disparaged as much by critics on the right as he was by the left. And in fact, he's got this excellent letter that I recommend everybody read. It's just, it's brilliant and it's hilarious. And um, it's a letter to the editor of Le Temps Moderne in response to their review of The Rebel. And he says, you know, it, that he's been criticized from the right and left, and he's as much ashamed by finding praise in, in the bougie sort of newspapers as he is by those among the right. And whether or not an opinion is on the right or the left side of an issue doesn't matter so much as whether or not that opinion is the right opinion on that matter. And I think there's a, a really depressing lack of politicians who are willing to stand for what's right mm. and too much of, of what motivates political decisions is based on what's expedient, how to keep their coalition in line and how to keep the donors coming at the expense of what's really good for, for people. And I think we see that now more than ever, particularly with these protests about the lockdowns, which are absolutely necessary for public health and the way that people are sort of positioning these as like threats to our democracy or threats to our freedom. When, when really what's at threat um, is this illusion that we don't actually already have enough to meet everybody's basic needs. Mm. And we do. And there's no reason to subject people to having to risk their lives to open up nail salons or barber shops anymore. We actually do have enough resources to make sure everybody has a roof over their head, everybody has enough food to eat, and everybody can see a doctor when they're sick but for the fact it is extremely profitable for some people to deny that. And I think Kemi would absolutely be railing against American politics right now. And most of it's politics. Your campaign. I will never run for political office. In fact, if I ever announce a candidacy, that's my way of signaling the aliens have kidnapped me. <laughs> you're like, yeah, I've been watching uh, Westworld. You're, you're a host. You're not like really a... Yeah, no, I will never... I do not have the temperament for political office. I do not have the tolerance for the nonsense. I don't want to shake hands. I don't want to have to pretend that things are not nonsense when they are nonsense. So much of our struggle is completely artificial and unnecessary, but for the fact it's profitable for many people. I mean, I'll, I'll be very brief because I want to open this up for questions. I, but I think and I would give this advice to anybody that's considering running for office. I think the, the impulse to do it should bubble up from your involvement in the community. Um, because I think what communities mostly don't need are people who think, who, who are from the outside or relatively uninvolved, who think that they have solutions to people's problems. Um, and so I'm much more in favor of someone um, that looks rather different than me running than someone like me. But as weird as it is, um, you know, I was happened to be the one that could step up in this moment. And, you know, I didn't have, you know, great expectations of winning. I know that you uh, were encouraging me to go for it and that I could probably win, Greg. And um, I think if I had more money, this is the other really disillusioning thing about politics. It requires a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And the people that have that money are not usually the people that are on the side of my politics. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, um, I did it because I'm a part of a tenant community here that's underrepresented. There are no tenants on city council and we kept getting rebuffed 
by our current city council in every effort we made to um, speak on behalf and with alongside the 56% of our city who are tenants. Uh, so it's a, you know, it's a, 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 a majority by a fair margin. And, um, and I, I think the other thing is you can, you can run for office for other reasons than to think that you're going to win. I mean, I think you should run, if you're going to run, you should run to win. But I think there are other side sort of off-label benefits to running, which is inserting your voice into the conversation, moving, insisting that incumbents answer some difficult questions. The worst thing in the world is for some, an incumbent to run unopposed. I think someone should step into the gap and challenge whoever is running unopposed, even if they're pretty good, you know? I think they need to be um, made to articulate their views. Um, well, I want to, thank you so much. I, we could keep going. I have so many- Lucky to have you and you should keep going with it. Thank you. I'll, I may do it again in four years if I'm still in Pasadena. Uh, I, I think I'll give it another shot. Um, but you know, the struggle continues as they say. So we, we're still doing, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's move to engage with, with the wonderful people on, on our line. Yeah. And I have a few, so I have a few thoughts here, um, that I've been tracking in the comments. Um, I wanted to give a moment to my friend, uh, Karen McQueen, who's on the call and I saw your comment, Karen, and I wonder if you would, I mean, I could read your comment, but if you wanted to unmute yourself and ask it, that would be so much better if you're willing. Uh, in the meantime, I can sort of, oh, there you are, you're unmuted. You can hear me? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm speaking out of my experience as a nurse and a professor of nursing and having students who will graduate fairly soon. And like most nurses, when they graduate, they will take an oath the Nightingale Pledge, which commits us to um, to care for people, no matter what the circumstance. Right now, those graduates will go right straight into hell, as our you know, fellow healthcare workers are doing now. And uh, for me, this typifies very much the issue of the practice of love irrespective of hope because these nurses and doctors and respiratory therapists don't even have the support to provide them with the minimal flimsy masks and gowns that are needed to protect their lives. And in, the, in this novel, I see a tension between the banality of the leaders in French Algeria and in that city who are tied up in bureaucracy and don't seem to be able to be effective and ordinary people who roll up their sleeves and take care of the sick and the dying. And, and the point I made was that in our circumstance, we're not dealing with the banality of leadership. We're dealing with leadership that is way past it is, it is um, far beyond anything that we could call the banality of evil. It's, it, it's much worse than that. Mm. And as to politics, for the, right now, for the sick, for the dying, for nurses, doctors, healthcare workers, for the poor, politics is not an option. We are fighting for our lives. It's a necessity. We are literally fighting for our lives. Uh, today, uh, the governor of Maryland was interviewed and on CNN and told a story that blew my mind, which was that on behalf of his state, he ordered and paid for 500,000 rapid uh, tests for this virus. Had the um, tests flown in on one plane, to an airport in Maryland, not Dulles, which would have been the normal place to land, but in Maryland so that it could be met by a contingent from the Maryland National Guard and state police to take those test kits to a secret storage place in Maryland to keep them away from FEMA, to keep them away from the Trump 
administration. So politics right now, for a lot of us, it's not, should we go into it? It's, do we just give up or do we fight? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty bleak. And I think it's, you make a really interesting point about um, the way that the politicians in the novel almost don't even figure into the story. Like, they're just so inept and so flat-footed. Like, in the beginning, I loved how I was reading the beginning of it towards the beginning of this outbreak and thinking how typical it was for them to sort of say, well, let's not do anything. Like, this isn't that serious. We don't want to alarm people. It was exactly the same things that we were uh, talking about in our own politics. Um, Charles, you, you had messaged me that you wanted to follow up on something that was said. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, I guess I had a couple of thoughts, uh, some, I guess, directly in response to you and some just uh, regarding the, the discussion as a whole. Um, I guess, first off, I really want to thank all of you for putting this together. It was, it was super um, uh, thought provoking. And, um, you know, in, in particular, when it, when, it, when it comes to a lot of your, you know, at, at least for, for Greg and Ryan, right, your, your personal paths out of organized religion, um, a lot of that resonated uh, with me. I, I should clarify in advance that, like, I I have read The Stranger, but have not actually read The Plague. I I did like catch up on the spark notes and some of the opinion pieces that that Ryan linked earlier. But uh, I, I definitely do want to, you know, get around to, to actually reading that novel. That said, you know, in, in, you know, uh, in terms of, <clears throat> uh, you know, sort of the like religious or in some ways like anti-religious themes. Um, I resonate a lot with my with my personal experience, having, you know, grown up uh, actually in uh, uh, an evangelical church that, uh, you know, sort of mostly the the expat Chinese community in in uh, in Boulder, Colorado, because, uh, you know, a big part of I think my my form my most my earliest formative like political experiences was rejecting that wholesale right. Um, abandoning religion pretty much, you know, going from like dutiful church going 11 year old to like atheistic 12 year old, you know, very quickly. Um, and, and in the process, I think for me, like that involved uh, as part of a general, like, like anti-traditionalist kind of adolescent rebellion, um, turning my back on a lot of aspects of my, of my uh, Chinese identity as well, because so many of the ways that, um, uh, I, I lived it were through, you know, that particular very conservative expat community, right? And 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 the ways in which my parents uh, uh, transmitted its values to me, and you know, I, I guess what I've what I've found since then, right, is that a lot of the 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 meaning that I suppose I never really found in in, in church, but which I was supposed to, right, uh, has has come through political organizing, and more and more so as as my politics have have developed and, and become more radical, I think. And then particularly with the, um, you know, the current COVID-19 pandemic and the wave of anti-Asian racism that has accompanied it, uh, you know, like there's, there's been for me a, a convergence as well, you know, with, with, with that side of my identity and coming to understand it as, as a source of pride, you know, uh, not, not as, as something to, to fall back on in, in a sort of conservative and, and, and traditionalist way as, as, as my parents do, but you know, um, uh, as, as, you know, something that, that in the world today, you know, is standing against uh, white supremacy on a global level, right? Uh, you know, in, in, terms of, in terms of the geopolitical rivalry between China and the U.S., I think, like for me, the question of anti-Asian racism in the U.S. and, and the U.S. propaganda campaign against China, right, uh, as well as like a bunch of other nations in, in the global south, you know, you can think of Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, and so on. Um, like, like, you know, for, for, for me, those two questions are inseparable, right? They're, they're two sides of the same coin. And, um, you know, uh, for, in, in terms of my political positioning, you know, with regard to the pandemic, that's something that I have been trying to emphasize, like, over and over within the circles that I'm in. And, you know, uh, just in terms of, I guess, you know, what has brought me meaning, right, and, and, uh, and, and fulfillment, uh, you know, on a personal level, 
uh, in the middle of this pandemic, right? Uh, you know, definitely that has stemmed to a huge degree as well through through being like like a a a, 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 a manifest and almost exaggeratedly like political actor, right? Um, in 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 solidarity with and in community with my fellow tenants in Pasadena, and also my fellow grad students here at Caltech, as we're you know uh, uh, fighting tooth and nail to stop uh, our our school from cutting our health benefits, which they are trying to do literally in the middle of the pandemic, and um, and so yeah, everything else that, that that people said, you know, in terms of the political valences of of the novel, really resonated with me as well, and. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely excited to actually, you know, go and read it in full. Awesome. A um, couple of thoughts that I wanted to share. And do you, do you mind, Jamie, Ryan, would you mind if I just made a quick comment to the uh, yeah. gentleman, Roy, in, in the comments? I actually just removed him from the... From the right. Well, okay. I mean, it's fine. Oh, if, he's okay. not on, if not on the call anymore, that's fine. But I mean, I was just going to say, listen, stop. All yeah. right. He's you know, with, with, the, with the open up America, just stop, okay? I mean, whether he's on the call, not on the call, like you want to sit in, maybe, maybe it's, you know, some part of your mind is, is learning something from this and that's why you came here to invade the conversation. Maybe you're not, you know, but the point is, this is a group of people that has compassion for the vulnerable. This is a group of people where what we care about is, uh, is people's health and well-being and their opportunity to live a decent life, not the fact that that some store, some business, some corporation, you know, needs to bump up its profit margin for this quarter or this year or whatever. All right. So just stop, go away, you know, literally or metaphorically, because what we're here to do is, is look out for people, look out for life, treat all people as equally worthy of dignity and worthy of a, of a chance to live on this planet and the fact that you don't feel like you're vulnerable doesn't mean that we don't care about the people who we think are vulnerable and no and we and we know that that could be any of us because that's the whole point we're all mortal we're all at risk so yeah. we're going to take care of people that's what we're here doing so go away if that's the that yeah. you have to agree with so proud so profoundly okay thank you no no, no um, it's, good. it's the whole point of why, what we're talking about here yeah. is the yeah. solidarity that ensues in a much greater way when we discover that we're literally in the same boat. Yeah. So I just, I just wanted to, to you know. Say yeah. That. Um, Jamie, you want to jump in or, or you know, yeah, because I, I could make a couple other comments on the comments, but that, that, that should suffice. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, I wanted, I wanted to sort of jump in. Ryan had mentioned the sort of disdain Camus or, or the shade he throws at officialdom and dealing with this. And I think it's so important, even in the myth of Sisyphus, Camus talks about how the subclerk is the equal of the conqueror. They have consciousness in common. And I think this is something that's really important. And I think it relates to what you were just talking to or, or, or sorry of saying to Roy, that we're all human beings. We're all capable of suffering. We're all capable of consciousness. We're all capable of mourning our losses. And to sort of dismiss that as, oh, you know, the death rate is 0.23% or whatever it is, misses the danger that we put other people in when we prioritize you know our own sort of selfish pursuits at the expense of, of the reality that other people have to face if we just open everything back up and infections spread and the hospitals collapse then it's not just about the people who are going to die from this virus it's the people who get into a car accident and can't get into the emergency room who need help who are in danger it's the people who have a heart attack and can't safely be brought into triage because it's an infectious area and it's this awareness that we're in all of this together. We're not supposed to just sort of mindlessly go about our lives accumulating as much stuff as possible. Mm. We're supposed to sort of create some kind of meaning from all of this to, to, to rest beauty or joy where that's possible. And the only way to really do that is to lock arms with one another and realize that we're in this struggle together. And that being a sub or a conqueror doesn't actually change your value as a human being, but your capacity for just being alive is what really matters. Or as Camus says, what matters quite simply is being human. Mm. And that's what we can't lose sight of. I and mean, I think that's what's so important to return our focus to. And that's what Camus, I think, ultimately says is, is the lesson of this plague. It forces us to pay attention to what all of the things we've been using to distract ourselves had turned us away from. Yeah, thank you. In the comments, some people are talking about habits, and I thought this was really relevant to what you're saying about 
being human and like the, the, mo the most like common things that we share. Uh, and then I see David, Stephen Cunningham has his hand up as well. So let me just make this quick comment. So it starts by David Severson saying that the plague in the beginning is filled with people just doing their ordinary things, living their ordinary lives, including this weird guy who spits on cats. Um, and, and of course, with the plague going around, spitting is now forbidden. And, you know, he says, what, what, what do you hope will rebound as like the habits that you hope will persist or, or return rather when, when our plague is over? And I just really loved also Sarah's comment about how Grand uh, just has this quest for the perfect sentence. This like quirky guy who's, he keeps rewriting the first sentence of his novel a horrible sentence too <laughs> and then at the end he's like i just took all the adjectives out and i'm like oh like someone like hemingway would be so proud <laughs> you know just make, makes a much better sentence he took the so the, the whole moral of the story is like don't put so many adjectives in your sentences like that's the whole point of the, of the play um but any any thoughts about like habits of our lives and um and you know i think of aristotle of course anytime i think of habits and the way that he talks about how how ethics is, or how, you know, eth part of ethics is about transmitting habits and, and behaviors to, to the next generation or to others in our sphere, and, and how, like, our lives are made up of, of these um, habitual patterns that we, that we learn and then engage in. Um, anything that you guys want to see come back as a normal habit, or maybe something new that you think it will be a new pattern. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure how well this qualifies, but, uh, you know, the, the, it, it, to, to respond to this and to tie it into the comments that were made before, um, uh, maybe by, by Charles and Karen. Um, so I was born in 1977. Um, and I think that that has been pretty shaping in my life in the sense that um, I was born, in, in, you know, a few years after the Vietnam War and um, a few years before the the roaring 80s followed by the roaring 90s you know which were you know more like with the 80s than, than we sometimes like to admit but with you know more 90210 sideburns and, and pompadours um, and um, yeah. Because, because if, if, if you know, you know, I have, if anything, I have a white male American perspective on this, right? Like, of course, no other cultural metaphor would be salient. Um, yeah. But anyway, um, so I, I was born as one of the few people, uh, you know, in the history of the world where um, it was really possible uh, for politics to seem super optional for me. Um, because there, you know, for somebody like me, there was this feeling of like, yeah, you know, this is all so normal. Everything, you know, like, like the, there, there's going to be an end of history. We're all getting to the point where it's great. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, 9-11 helped to change that for some of us, it, you know, certainly helped to, to break me out of a certain way of thinking, um, and, and it, you know, it was a, it was a marker, but I do think that, um, we've been, we've been in a period recently in this country where more people were starting to recognize that having solidarity with one another and with all people, um, in some sort of tangible political organized way is in the sense the ultimate way to give one's life meaning in other words as as our uh, mutual friend martin hagland a professor at yale uh, might say that 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 have manifesting solidarity with other human beings in some kind of combination of political and community organizing um, on a broad scale is the ultimate form of secular spirituality mm -hmm. And it's sort of difficult to, to feel that entirely when, when we're all in a freaking Zoom meeting all the time. But I do think that, that little moments like this that we're all doing tonight are part of that and that we will resume that and that, that, that there will be more talk after all of this of 
organizing with one another to care about one another and to make the world better for people and not just for like tiny slivers of people that are just suffering and manifesting their suffering on us by taking all the stuff like that that is going to continue to to be more and more prominent as a form of spirituality as a form of um what you could call religion if we wanted to use the word religion yeah i think there's some conversation in the in the um chat about exile christopher murray is pointing out um i, I was saying to uh to jamie and greg on our planning call yesterday that the one thing i love about having like the print book but also like my um kindle copy is that i can search you know and so I, one of the things I did when I finished reading it was I searched the word exile to see how many times it appeared and where. And I went back and I, huh? It's 23 times. 23 what? times, yeah. And it's early and, and late. So it's, it's early, late, and often. You know, it's like throughout the book. And it really is. Um, and again, it's not so subtle, right? I mean, I think I, lo I love about this book is that it's, it's beautiful on a literary level. Um, the, the writing is just poetic in places. And... Uh, and yet it's not like, it's not hard to grasp the point. Like it's a book about exile in which they're trapped inside of a city that's in a pandemic. Like get it, get it, like it's an exile. And they're separated from their, two of the main characters are separated from their partners. I mean, it's not super complicated to understand going, going into it. And yet there's so much written, richness in that notion. And I think um, one of the, I mentioned earlier on that one of the main themes, if not the main theme of the Hebrew Bible is exile and return and finding home again, like homelessness and displacement and, and home and what, what it would mean to be home. And I think this vision of a better world that so many of us are fighting for um, in which we don't have, I mean, you know, I was, I, I caused a little dust up on my Facebook this afternoon by, you know, saying that, Andrew Cuomo should be ashamed of himself for talking about homeless people the way that he did. You know, talk about the ultimate exile is like being homeless and sleeping on a train and then, uh, and then being shamed for being in everyone's way and potentially making other people sick, which is a re realistic concern. Um, but the idea that this, this I, you know, virus has made it apparent to those of us who don't typically feel like exiles that perhaps we too are exiles and exiled from ourselves, from our sort of core identity uh, as humans, um, as well as from people that we love and care about. Um, so, you know, I think that's a, a profound theme and really worth endless exploration. I don't know if you have any final thoughts on that. And I think I have a, a final quote to kind of read us out that you gave us, Jamie. Jamie, do you have any last last words? I, I feel like you might have last words before Ryan reads us out. Um, I mean, I can talk about Camus forever. I, I absolutely think it's correct that exile and separation is the key theme that Camus is wrestling with here. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that he's got this notion sort of being like exiled from the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of what we're really exiled from is, is, is a universe that we can sort of accept and condone. And I think we can see that when he's talking about Father Panalu and how he ultimately comes to his demise and this idea that we can't ever get access to the kingdom of heaven. It's beyond us. It doesn't exist. There is no God. There is no salvation. We are all of us exiled. And the task before us is to do as much as we can to create as much goodness and beauty in our lives while we have the chance do. I think that is really ultimately Camus' message. So let me share this one final uh, quote, which I find so beautiful. And um, this is on the last page. So spoiler alert, I guess. This is how, how it ends. Well, there's one more paragraph after this. Um, so Ryu's now exposed himself as the narrator of the book. And he writes in closing, uh, nonetheless, he now he's still talking about himself in the third person, which is weird. Um, he knew that the tale he had to tell could not be one of total victory. It could only be the record of what had had to be done and what assuredly would have to be done again in the never-ending fight against terror, its relentless onslaughts, despite their personal afflictions by all who, while unable to be saints, but refusing to bow down to pestilences, 
strive their utmost to be healers. Um, which is, I think, a really beautiful reflection on Teru's comments earlier, that there are basically only pestilences and victims, and then possibly this third category of healers. And it comes back again here at the end of the book, um, that this desire, we may never make it, we might not ever see ourselves as healers, um, but that by taking the side of the victims, we may never win a total victory, but we can try to be, try to be healers. Yeah, I just, I just, if I can, I just want to jump in here too. There's this scene sort of close to the end um, where the town is celebrating, the gates have been opened, um, and, and Ryu has found out that his, his wife has died, and he's, he's separate from the revelry. R Ryu does, is not a winner here. He loses his friends, Ranbear is going to leave, Teru dies, his wife dies, and there's this moment, and it's described not as, as revolt, but just sort of taking in all of the excitement at the end of the plague. And I don't think it's an accident at all that Ryu is, is not victorious in the way that we tend to understand that in, you know, American sort of Hollywood happy endings. Ryu, in a very sense, in a very real sense, he loses. He loses everything. And yet we're still to understand him as the hero. He dug in, he did what was right. And I think that's the model that Camus is after, that we can't judge our successes by whether or not we win but by whether or not we, we, we plant the seeds of the flower that someone else will be able to enjoy. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I think a really uh, good place to, to conclude. I, I, I just want to name that this format is super weird, but also super cool in a way that all of us from all over the country are able to do this, but also weird in the sense that there's over 30 of you that didn't get to say anything out loud, which always makes me uncomfortable. But thank you for sharing in the chat. Um, we will uh, share this on our uh, YouTube channel, so, um, and I, I'll give it to the Humanist Association as well to share there. And, uh, and I, 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 think, I think we should, I, I want to acknowledge anyway, I don't know if you would agree with me, that, that um, you, if you participated in the seminar by listening, what you did is also, is you provided healing and therapy for me. And, you know, maybe for Ryan and Jamie too, but I'll, I'll at least, you know, own it for myself, right? Like, it, you know, people like me, I mean, I'm, I'm looking for ways to be useful right now. Um, and, you know, to be able to share a conversation like this and know that there are other people that, that care to spend their hour and a half really thinking about what the meaning of our lives is right now and, and really thinking about um, how to, to help someone heal or someone rebel or someone um, create beauty where there otherwise wouldn't have been. Um, just, just your presence and, and knowing that, that you care about the same topic in some way um, is therapeutic for me. So thank you. Yeah, well said. Yeah, same. I love talking about Camus. This is great. Yeah, I know. Jamie always says, like, you know, anytime. Camus, anytime. Camus all the time. <laughs> all the time, yeah. And, uh, and I, I happen to know that, that uh, I imposed upon Greg's family time tonight. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, I got to put Axel to bed. That's true. Yeah, and I got, I, I'm only, it's only 525 here on the West Coast. So I've, I've got my evening ahead of me. So thank you, those of you on the East Coast. And we will do a few more of these. Uh, I've got good comments in the, in the chat. So be well, everyone. Stay healthy. If you're still and, in the uh, you. Be one of the healers. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.